Let's Get Two presents... Five, four, three, two, one... It's a high drive center field. Veerling's back. This game is turned upside down. And the pitch is lifted to right by Cassianos. Long run for Tucker over toward the line and foul territory. Makes the catch and the Houston Astros do it again. 2022 World Series champions. And now, go, go Astros. Astros baseball from three guys who've been there since Art Howe had hair. And for those of you expecting to see Go Go Astros, we do apologize. They will not be on the air today, but we have a wonderful episode of Go Go Astros Roadshow where we are showing off a Astros, their current Star Wars bobblehead, which uh, not only is it a cool bobblehead with Bregman and Altuve and Pena on it, but it's from the last time the Astros have won a series, the second to last time they won a game. Um for as much as I'd love to do this, guys, I guess, Brian, Andy, we actually do have to talk about the baseball that was played uh, this weekend. Andy, before the, I'm sorry, Brian, before the show started, Andy says we don't talk enough about the bad defense on the team. So why not talk enough about the bad defense on the team right now? Uh, the defense has, I mean, so one is people usually, you know, the, the, the first level way to look at defense is through errors. The better way to look at that is through conversion of outs. Uh, it's one of the advances in defense from analytics. Sorry, everybody. Um, and we have been one of the best defensive teams in baseball up through this season. And a particularly a defensive slump by Cal Tucker has uh, really hurt the team this year on Bregman's era yesterday. Sucked him. Uh, Andy? I mean, stats being what they are, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I also know that I sat through a game where Jeremy Pena cost us two runs in a game that we lost by two In runs. an inning. In the same inning. In an inning. And yesterday, evidently, we can't catch balls that are thrown directly to us to tag people out in extra innings. I don't know what this team's curse is in extra innings, which is a whole separate topic, but it feels to me like we, during this swoon, let's call it two weeks now, We've seen Bregman throw balls away. We've seen Pena throw balls away. We've seen what we thought we were going to get with Abreu at first base um, and really questionable plays in the outfield. Uh, I know Jake Myers has incredible closing speed, but he made some really poor decisions. And admittedly, we're all falling in the vacuum, or at least I'm falling in the vacuum of this has been a really crappy two weeks of baseball. And so everything feels magnified. But a lot of it feels magnified because they're doing really boneheaded things. Yeah, a lot of questionable decisions. I've always thought that 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 Myers, I know for all his his numbers, has always taken bad routes to balls, and I feel like he has kind of a noodle arm. But we get to we know that from him. And honestly, if he didn't have a ginormous gourd on top of his shoulders, we wouldn't have won a game. So I'm not going to get yeah. too hard on uh, on Myers this week, but. Yeah, it's definitely been the kind of week, um, Andy, that makes you wish you watched more. Is the Premier League still going, Brian? I don't know. Is that still a thing? Um, the U.S. defeated Canada last night to be the best nation in soccer in CONCACAF. So uh, take that, Canada. Yeah, well, let's you know what? Let's turn this into a <laughs> soccer. Did, did they not invite Mexico this year? <laughs> They got lost. They took uh, Southwest. Mex uh, uh, Mexico, uh, Mexico lost to the U.S. in the semifinals, three nothing, and the match had to be ended early because Mexican fans were celebrating Pride Month by uh, chanting homophobic slurs. Ah. Cheers, everyone. So uh, we're not talking about the Rangers just yet. We'll get to them though uh, here in a minute, Brian. But yeah, Andy, I mean this this I I to use some unscientific terms, the week just sucked, and you know. 
I, I, I want to go to you. The week for, blue. The week blue. Yeah. Sorry. Um, actually, we'll go to Brian on first on this because Andy, you something we talked about off camera, but it seems like um, the the offense hit yesterday. And the Astros forgot how to pitch. It just seems like no matter what's happening, um, the other things aren't happening. Yeah, and it kind of speaks to there's a lot of poor play. There's also something we identify in baseball sequencing, right? That if you, you know, had they given up 20 runs instead of 10 runs on Saturday and pitched well the other games, they'd have been better off. <laughs> Um, you know, just put all your runs in sort of one game. It doesn't quite work that way, but there's something to that, right? They've lost a bunch of one-run games, except, of course, for the one-run game they won um, and lost somehow uh, against the Nationals this week. Uh, they blew the three-run lead in the ninth and then won it um, somehow. Um, you know, it, it's it's a lot of sort of, uh, sort of snowballing things that um, – you know, if it's not the hitting one day, it's the pitching. If it's not the pitching one day, it's the fielding, and none of it's in a good combination. Um, I will note they're on a streak of which they've lost four. Uh, they've lost ten of the last fourteen. It's the worst stretch of the season by far. It's left us uh, contemplating. You know, you know, left our viewers contemplating really if this coffee or this is something else in my uh, beverage this morning. <laughs> um, they're off a stretch, and they were nineteen and five. Sure. Um, before that. And this is a team that is neither as good as 19 and five, nor as bad as four and 10. Uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle, obviously not as good as it was last year. Um, and so I don't expect this to continue over the long term, but I don't really care about the long term. I just care about winning tonight as well. I also have oh. to deal with Mets fans. You know, and Andy, uh, like everything that's prefaced in this is us understanding that, um, this is still a team that's not been complete at all this year, that there's still the hope of getting Alvarez back and Brantley back and reloading in some spots. Um, however, Andy, we're already starting to see our wonderful fan base start to wonder if we should be sellers at um, the deadline. One, what do we have to sell? But um, please talk me off the ledge about people. I can't believe I'm already reading this. I uh, just get off of Twitter. That, that, that ultimately, just get off of Twitter. Uh, we have a very entitled fan base. Um, and I hate this criticism, but it's true to an extent that we gained a lot of fans starting in 2017, and it has just increased over the last seven years. Um, it, it's we're not rational, we're not a rational fan base. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what a struggling baseball team looks like because they haven't had to deal with it. And they have really selective memories because like, yeah, I saw that. I, yeah. I saw somebody say, well, the 2017 team never had to do hey, it's Quint. Or is that yeah. made? Somebody's no, you. We uh, little, uh, we got a little Quint guest starring role. Come here, Quint. Sorry. But the 2017 team had a 10 or a four and 10 stretch uh, in June and they had to deal with it, and they got out of it. This is not the 2017 team, but every team goes through some stretch like this with the exception of that Mariners team who, you know, set that record, and they didn't advance in the playoffs. So Yeah, they went through that stretch, all right. They just did it in October. But it's it, – our, our fans are unrealistic, um, but I think the team has certainly underperformed even the most conservative estimates of what they were going to be to this point. Um, Alvarez is going to come back uh, today, I guess, is the first day he's eligible to come back off the IL. Uh, that's not going to happen for at least two more weeks, probably three, maybe four. Um, Altuve is up and down. Uh, you saw criticism of him not starting on Sunday because he had a four hit game on Saturday. So, of course, Dusty rested him. Uh, it, we, we've got a bunch of angry people complaining about things because of results and not process, which just is uh, my own personal picadillo. You're going to have guys that have days off. You're going to have guys that perform well and then, you know, need to heal from a nagging toe or quad or ab or whatever it is. Our Yankee friends would prefer you not use the word toe and aching in the same sentence. Well, does he have this comfort? Right. James, are, are other teams struggling as well? Because Yeah, I mean... That seems 
No uh, other. Hey, team I've been told that uh, you know, if we, I guess if we can discuss Hillary's emails, we can discuss other teams struggling. No other team has ever struggled like this Astros team ever in the history of Astros or something. I don't I just stay off Twitter is the only advice I have to give on this topic because we're unrealistic and silly right now. Like to Brian's point, everything that can go bad is going bad. And it's not everything, every game. Like yesterday we did hit uh pitching collapsed. Didn't play defense. Well, tonight it could be that we throw a one hitter against the Mets who also struggling this year against expectations and reality. Um, but we might not hit. It, it's just, it's a crapshoot every night and it will get better. I just don't know how much better at this point. And anybody who tells you they do know, it's kind of just selling you something. Brian, there's a lot to react to. Would you like to begin reacting? Yeah. I mean, I think we're all in, you know, a similar point here where it's not as bad as it seems right now. Um, if you look at it any perspective other than just having watched this weekend. Um, I think we're also all of the opinion, right, that team is not as good as it was last year. Uh, probably not as, as, you know, not as good as it's been in the best years of this run. Um, and there's still a talented baseball team that's not going to go four and, you know, not going to go four and 10 over most stretches of the season. Um, What's the big issue with the team? The offense has been mediocre. And I wrote about this this weekend uh, on my Substack. Um, it's not, it, it, the biggest issue has been some of the key spots in the lineup. Okay. Bregman in particular, uh, Brayu, we compare it to last year, uh, have been down. And that has, there's a handful of players who are getting better this year than last year. Dubon and Myers would be at the top of that list. But yeah. those are, you know, players who play a lot, but not every day. And they're not offsetting the declines we're getting from, from other places. The optimistic take on that is that, hey, Bregman's not going to be a league average hitter all season. He hasn't been in his career. He's likely to get better over time. Abreu can't be this bad, can he? Well, he's been really good for the last two weeks. So, I mean, there's he's that. Bad this, he's bad this series, but we've seen we've seen we've seen some improvement. But you know, it's been it's been fleeting and taking a long time. And you know, hopefully, he gets back to being something close to what we expected uh, when we signed him. But again, those have dragged down the offense, and that has been, on the whole, particularly problematic. How much do Brian have? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. Sorry, I'll, I'll take Abreu's week for the rest of the season. He hit three hundred. I mean, he. he Abreu was not the problem this week. Yeah. Um, Bregman might come back because evidently Brian McCann called him yesterday or before yesterday's game and told him to move his elbow and he went three for five. So that's all it took, which immediately prompted our Twitter fans going, why can't our hitting coaches see elbows? Um, again, stay off Twitter. I, I, Completely forget, lost my train of thought at that point. Um, that was literally a response. Why can't our coaches see elbows? Yeah. Oh, I yeah, I heard. That. Yeah, it's and it's 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 it is definitely it's asinine and it's silly. Um, Brian, I want to talk a little bit about the bullpen in a second, but how much to it? Like you've met, you've mentioned lack of left-handed bats in the lineup. Um, I've seen a lot of people talk about a lack of power, which makes me wonder, should we just steer into that's what the team is? But how much of also it is it that it's just a shorter lineup than it's been in a long time, and therefore it's easier to attack a lineup if you've only got five spots that you're worried about? Yeah. Um, good offenses. Hey, in 2017 and in 2019, when they had absolutely fabulous offenses, they had, you know, average to above average hitters at just about every spot in the lineup and that means that you know if you walk the sixth guy you got to deal with the seventh guy who is almost as good and is just as likely to get a hit and if he gets a hit the eight guy comes up well currently now the six seven and eight guys are people who are not as likely to get a hit more likely to make an out and again off Offense in baseball is about a chain of good is getting a chain of good events to go together, and there's not enough good events to se sequence them together right now. And did you want to uh, continue on down that path? Um, 
I, I hate playing the game of second guessing the manager, but I'm you know about to do it. You mean the statistically uh, worst manager uh, in the history of baseball? I was told yesterday. Yes, he's horrible, and the Astros have won in spite of him and not because of him. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's no in between in those two statements, by the way. Yeah. Um, I don't understand, and I'm sure there's some explanation. Maybe Brian, you know, from a number standpoint, why we have decided that Altuve is not our leadoff hitter anymore, and in when you talk about Dusty and things that, you know, again, I don't want to second guess the manager, but there's an approach now in baseball that you just stack your best hitters at the top of the lineup and you take what you can get from the bottom part. And Dusty has been mostly resistant to that this year. Again, we've missed Alvarez for now two weeks. Altuve was out for two months. Other guys have been in and out and hurt, and not performing. So I understand juggling a little bit, but I think we all probably believe the optimal lineup based on who we have is Altuve leading off Pena hitting second, whether or not that is a real thing. He hits better in the set in the second yeah. position than he does anywhere else in the lineup. And then Alvarez when he's healthy batting third, and then you set the rest of the lineup from there. However, Dusty wants to set it. And we don't do that. And Dusty doesn't do that. And for the last week and a half, Altuve is not our leadoff hitter anymore. Is that a reflection of injury? Is that a reflection of Dusty outsmarting himself? Is that something the analytics show that we don't understand as fans? I, I'm I'm at a loss with having one of the best leadoff hitters in baseball batting second. Yeah, I mean, you sort of set that up pretty well. Um, modern thought is that the most important spot in the lineup is not the cleanup spot, it's the two spot. So... You know, my best defensive Dusty is, I think Altuve is my best hitter right now. I'm going to put him in the two spot. But as you point out, Dusty tends to sort of think of, I have middle of the order guys, and they hit in the middle of the order. They drive in runs. And then I have, you know, kind of leadoff guys in one and two who set things up. And again, not everybody's that, you know, remember the World Series last year, Kyle Schwarber was the leadoff hitter. Yeah. He doesn't look, he right. doesn't look or steal bases like a leadoff hitter, but he sure hits home runs like a cleanup hitter. You can do it all sorts of different ways. Um, I think what he's trying to do is stack more of his best hitters towards the middle of the order. If you left it up to me, I'd stack my best hitters, but put them towards the top of the order. Like I think Bregman's better at the top of the lineup because he takes a ton of walks yep. and that has two benefits. He gets on base a lot with that and two, he forces a lot of pitches on the opposition. Well, I mean, if you're going to go crazy, I, I, and maybe that's what my big problem is, is yeah. that if we're stacking our best hitters towards the middle and Altuve is your two-hole hitter, you're leading off with Corey Jolks for some reason with his 270 OPS. Oh, or, yeah. Or, or Chaz McCormick, uh, which I guess is the best option if it's not Altuve. But if Bregman's your big guy who gets on base and might start hitting at some point, why not? It, 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 you're married to Altuve being two-hole. Fat Bregman leadoff. He'll be on base. He's not a stupid base runner. So that makes more sense to me than in this Corey Jolks experiment that we've been going through the entire season. And again, the season is not Corey Jolks problem. That's a front office issue, but yeah. um, it's just, I'm, I'm befuddled by the lineups that are being put out. And it does seem yeah. to me like if you're going to have a short lineup, like the Astros have right now, and when where because we talked about this at the game the other day, Brian, where you know pretty much the Astros get three or four one, runs with the way the pitching staff has been, you're going to win. I think that rather than space out your outs, let's put all the the good the good hitters up at the top. Survive what you can do when we get through what six through nine. And I, again, I'm not a smart guy necessarily, but it just seems to me that you're over, they're overcomplicating things. Yeah, potentially so. One thing to note here, Dusty greatly values consistency that sort of his best players can come in every day and they don't even have to check the lineup card. They know they're in the lineup. They know where they're hitting. They don't have to sort of worry about that. Is that valuable? He believes psychologically it is. But Altuve he, hits lead off in that in your scenario. You could do that too. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's, I think, been a shocking Surprise to us for we can now talk about it. It's been a few weeks. Is Brian Abreu um has I don't know what it is. We'll start with you, uh, Andy, because you talked about him spotting his fastball before, but um I think it's beyond oh, he's tired at this point. Um it's 
I think I think there's two things going on. It's similar to what Ryan Presley is going through. Um, they get very happy with a particular pitch and ignore uh, the need to mix things up. And I think you add that. Uh, and Presley's issue, uh, and he talked about it, is that he got very slider happy. And he's throwing it more than 53% of the time. And hitters are just sitting on it because he's not throwing a fastball. So why do I even care to wait for a fastball? Um, Abreu's in a similar position. Um but I think different than Presley, not wanting to throw a fastball, Abreu doesn't trust his fastball. He can't spot it. He can't get it over the plate for strikes. And if you can't get it over the plate for strikes, your secondary out pitch isn't effective. Uh, now, having said all that, if you look at his, most of even his underlying numbers, he's still performing well, but it's a lot more of a laborish struggle this year than it has been last year. Um, so I think there is the inability to spot his fastball. I think there is getting a little bit predictable in what he's throwing when he's throwing. Um, I also think the reality is that he had a great season last year, regardless of whether or not he's technically been in the majors since the 2020 season or a little bit before that, actually, um, hitters develop a book on every pitcher and it's up to the pitcher. We talk about it all the time, the pitcher making adjustments when people start figuring him out. And I think he's just at one of those stages. Um, he has all the talent in the world. I expect him very likely to be our closer next year um, because Presley's contract will be over next year and you need to start that transition at some point. And if we're going to go traditional closer role, he's the most logical guy. Um, but I think there's a number of factors playing into making him look less effective, but he's still pretty darn effective. Ryan's about Ryan. to tell me that I'm wrong, but yeah, I mean, this month, this month, um, uh, 9.1, 9.1 innings in the month of June, um, two earned runs, 11 strikeouts, two walks. That's not peak, Ryan. That's not peak, excuse me, Brian Abreu, but that's a 1.93 year, right? Sometimes they just get got, and I think yesterday he just get got. I just wish it didn't happen in a one run game. Well, and I also think he's getting got in a in a in a scenario where Montero is untrustable at this point. Um, even Stanek is more. It seems like Stanek is um, showing why he didn't pitch a lot in the playoffs, Brian, last yeah. year. Um, it does seem like a lot of the bullpen outside of Naris seems to be in Naris and in a. Uh, and Mayton are kind of hitting a weird um they're having that funk they have every year but again that funk is magnified by the fact that the offense isn't hitting yeah yeah well, I think, absolutely i think one of the issues too is just bullpen guys are bullpen guys for a reason um and we can talk analytically about some of the things but to have a lights out bullpen year after year after year with the same guys almost never happens um, you might have a closer who's incredible. You might have a setup guy who's incredible year after year, but the reality is they're mostly fungible pieces. And the best thing a front office can do is put together a competent bullpen every year. Um, we still have a competent bullpen. That's it. They're, they're going through a stretch right now. Some of that is driven by the fact that they're probably not as good as they were last year. Um, the league has adjusted a little bit to them. The other part of it is our starters are not going as deep into games, uh, even though Dusty is going to get 100 pitches out of his starters no matter what happens. Unfortunately, sometimes that's Brandon Belak, and that's four and a third innings. Um, so you're having to pull more innings out of your bullpen. Uh, the Astros, despite Seth Martinez, don't really have a true setup guy um, who can go more than one inning at a time effectively. And so you're seeing a lot of usage, a lot of more usage. And this is also a team that played until the end of October last year or into the first week of November. Um, they've thrown a lot of innings uh, and it's. And the year before. And there's not and a the new, year before. Yeah. And there's not a, really a new piece in that bullpen. So I'm not making excuses for them um, because they haven't performed for the last couple of weeks the way we expect them to. But I don't think. You know, Brian, we, we talk about um, one run games being a lot of luck. Uh, it's a lot less luck when your bullpen can't hold a lead. Uh, I, I, I I did it again yesterday. If we get to extra innings, I just turn the game off because we don't seem to know how to win those games. But a lot of that's just our bullpen 
for whatever reason appears to crater in those situations. Yeah, they definitely cratered lately. And, and I think, um, you know, I, th- I do think it's, it's what we've talked about before. I think it, you're right. The a bullpen often will regress the Montero de- deal. It's still a good deal. Cause he's not really making all that much money. And at the time with the information you had, he was one of the better bullpen arms last year. And so I, I think that's one of the things I hate the most about fans is this revisionist history. Um, instead of history, let's, let's look revisionist future-ish. Um, it does look like Dana Brown's got some work to do at the trade deadline. Um, again, there's some talk amongst fans about whether we should do anything but sell. But I've seen names floated. Um, I think MLB Network floated Dickerson from the Nationals, who I would welcome. Brian, um, how do you, how would you like to see the trade deadline approached? And then we'll get to Andy on that. Yeah, there, there are two major areas where the team could use an upgrade. The first would be a left-handed bat. In the ideal world, that left that left-handed bat could play both left field and first base, um, and that would give you a better alignment in the outfield. Um, where you have, you know, I mean, you have Cal Tucker as left-handed hitter, but you have three right-handed hitters, and you know, you could really use a platoon advantage. The second would be a starting pitcher. We haven't talked about it, but Lance McCullers has had surgery this week. That's going to put him out. Oh, yeah, that's our last topic. The entire yeah. season, so. Uh, at least one thing we get for the next three and a half months of the season is not having to listen to Lance McCullough's rehab updates. On the other hand, we're going to get them all next spring. So that'll be something to talk about. Um, And I've been less sort of thinking they need to get a pitcher because if your postseason rotation is Fromber, Javier, McCullough's and Hunter Brown, I think that's pretty good. And I'm not sure there's a lot of pitchers better than Hunter Brown on the trade market now. Now you need to find a pitcher better than Jose or Kitty, who, presuming he comes back, uh, would be your fourth <laughs> best, would be your fourth best starter. Um, and so that's a bigger goal and more doable. The issue, of course, for the Astros is they don't have a ton of assets that they can trade. And I guess the second the second issue is there's not a lot of teams who are clearly out of it. Right. And that's the effect yeah. of that of the three wild cards, right? We knew yeah. this when it got yeah. said, Andy, that, that this was gonna be part of the reality of teams are gonna have to be a lot more deliberate if they do want to sell. And I I have seen um thoughts where maybe the Astros don't go super aggressive. So that way they can at least begin to build out some of those assets to make deals down the road. Overall, Andy, how do you want to see the Astros approach the trade deadline? I mean, everybody's saying the same thing, and I think it's right. You need another starting pitcher, um, and you need another bat in whatever form that comes through. Um, How you deal with I mean, we're not in a wild card spot right now. You can get back in it pretty quick. Well, I get I, I take that back. We are tied with the Yankees for the last wild card spot. But we're now trailing the Angels in the division uh, by a game. We can fix that fairly easily. Um it'll depend what's available cuz if you look at the standings in Major League Baseball, there's only a couple teams that wouldn't say they're going to make the playoffs. Um uh, and GMs are a good GM knows when the team's not going to do it, but that's a really hard sell when you're five games out of a playoff spot and a good week could get you back in it. And how do you sell tickets the rest of the season when you tell your fan base, well, yeah, we're not that good. Um, so everybody's going to be going after Kansas City. Everybody's going to be going whatever's left in Oakland. I don't know what's there. I, <laughs> um, everybody's going to be going after St. Louis, Colorado, and Washington because – Outside of those teams, pretty much every other team is within nine games of being in a playoff spot. And that's still a, a fixable thing in a regular in a regular season. Um, I think St. Louis matches up well with a couple of our needs. I don't know what we have that they would want. Um, and that's it, it comes up about once a week in my mind, but every time I hear that we don't have, you know, the Astros paid no penalty for the sign stealing scandal these draft picks that we lost in 2020 and 2021 uh, loom larger and larger. That's a two first rounds and two second rounds that you don't have in your system, whether they're playing for the, uh, the major league roster or not, you don't have those players to deal with. 
So there's a lot of flexibility that we lost. And, you know, $5 million international signing pool means there's another guy we didn't go get or two right. guys we didn't go get. Um, I'd like, you know, I want to see a left-handed bats. I still, you know, don't think that's Michael Brantley this year, although evidently he is swinging from cages now and not feeling pain, which is good. Um, I looked up Urquidy throwing. I just typed in Urquidy throwing in the Google machine. Here's the first three things you see. May 26, Urquidy throws from flat ground. May 30th, Urquidy throwing from 90 feet. May or 20 hours ago, Urquidy throws bullpen session. So he's progressing. Yeah. Pretty soon we'll get the Lance McCullers updates on him just in Spanish. So um, check your uh, alternate alternate language channels for that. Um, that. And I think that's the problem is that what can we get for the pieces that we have without taking somebody or a couple of somebody's off the major league roster to go get a pitcher who's going to be better than Jose or Keating? What can we get to put in? And maybe an outfielder is a little bit easier to attain, but there's going to be a lot of competition. And right now only five, six teams that could legitimately call themselves sellers and nobody's going to blink at it. Um, what you would hope to have is something like a, and it maybe works out better, but a Trey Mancini deal with a team that is kind of in the middle, like the Baltimore was last year and is willing to shed a piece of payroll to get something in return. Um, and maybe that works out, but I, you know, it's still too early to kind of project who those guys are. Cause I, I don't want the Seth Browns of the world. I don't think the Seth Browns of the world fix our problems. Um, and I don't want any of that Oakland juju in our locker room, frankly. <laughs> <clears throat> Brian, do you have any other follow up to that? Uh, Oakland Juju is fine. It's anything else he brings from the Oakland clubhouse that uh, any other substances he brings that may be more worrisome. But anyway, uh, I mean, the other thing to note here is they're not making a deal today, partly because sellers don't want to sell right now because yeah. their prices are higher. Um and, you know, it's harder to sort of do that. They're waiting for sort of more, you know, they may, hey, more teams will have needs. So the market may clarify over the next month, but it may not clarify in a way that's helpful to the Astros. Uh, um, uh, several weeks ago, you said the Reds are sellers. Uh, the Reds have brought up these young, these young prospects who look pretty good, and they're now definitely in the race uh, to win the central division. Perhaps the best thing the Astros could do is somehow get moved into one of these central divisions <laughs> really solve that wild card, you know, problem. They'd be, you know, the Twins are leading the uh, the AL Central with um, uh, with a 500 record. Um, so you know, hey, this season feels a lot like 2020. So maybe that means they get the sixth seed and end up having to go to Minnesota for a best of three series, which uh, could work out again. Well, and you know. <clears throat> Andy, the obviously pitching depth it, it becomes an issue if you do get into the playoffs as a wild card. But I just have to think that the benefit to all of that was is maybe by September going into October, the team will be complete. And we have just been saying this whole time, tread water until everybody's back. And I still think that they're meeting that standard. Yeah, but the the that ball keeps moving or goalpost keeps moving, right? So Tread water till people come back. Originally meant Altuve and Brantley and then McCullers. True. McCullers isn't coming back. Brantley is, let's just be optimistic and say iffy to come back. Um, and then Alvarez will be back at some points, but that's a new name. Arkady is a new name on that list. Garcia, we lost for an entire year and probably more than that. Um, so at some point, the war of attrition catches up with you. I don't know many teams who lose three starting pitchers for the season or at least large chunks of the season and are able to maintain the profile they've had for a number. I mean, I just, that, that, that's a huge issue for us yeah. and it's causing more things. I think it causes the offense to press when your starters aren't good. I think yep. it causes more stress on your bullpen when your starters aren't good. Um, and, and I'm not taking anything away from JP France because I think he has outperformed all expectations to this point. Um, but the reality is more what we saw from Brandon Belak this past weekend, um, where he throws 99 pitches in four and a third innings and leaves with a what four run deficit 
that that's and there's nothing else because now you're talking about if we need another arm Spencer Arigetti from Corpus making a major league debut spot start type thing because that's what's left Sean Dubin's not the guy um I, I read a really disheartening article on him because you know I yawned when we called him up yesterday uh he hasn't thrown more than 50 innings in like forever and those 50 innings might be spectacular but then his body just shuts down again yeah uh, so uh, maybe we just save him until August. I, I I don't know what the answer is at this point. Uh, we've got to get starting starts from somewhere. Uh, we've got to do something, but nothing's going to happen for another 45 days, realistically, from a roster improvement standpoint, outside of Alvarez coming back and maybe or Keedy close to after the All-Star break. You know, and, and you know, to his point, Brian, in 45 days, whatever it is, we'll be able to take a you know, we're pretty good at this show, I think, about not being sunshine pumpers and taking an, an honest look at at where the ball club is when we get there. Yeah, I mean, well, Joe, we have a balanced approach, which is we don't get too high when they're – we don't get uh, – basically, we don't get too low when they lose a game when they're good, and we don't get too high when they win a game when they're bad. Um, and so – Hey, this is still a talented team. There's every reason to expect that they're going to, you know, win more games than they lose over the rest of the season. And frankly, every reason to expect that they can still, that they can still make the playoffs. But this is a disheartening stretch, both from a, it's really frustrating, annoying to watch. And also it, it has harmed their chances of making it to October, both in the division and out of the division, both are realistic parts. Well, and I would point out as we get out of here, um, Andy, that for as much as the Astros have been three and seven in the last 10, the Rangers have been four and six. So this could be worse um, than what it is. And I think, you know, we've all seen, we've seen Anaheim do this at stretches before. Um, I I think that because of that, with about a hundred games to go, I still think there's plenty of time for the Astros to catch fire and actually win the division. Yeah, there, there, there's time, certainly. Um, you've got 90-plus games left in the season that nobody should be throwing in any kind of towels. Um, but the Astros have more work cut out for them ahead of them than they have in a number of seasons. Uh, and you can't even really count 2020 where they kind of figured out, well, we just have to get in the playoffs and we're locked into second place in the division. So guaranteed a spot, so why why, why push it? Um Ultimately, though, losing the number of starting pitchers and the number of innings those pitchers have provided, uh, that, that, that to me this is the question that has to get answered and has to get answered quickly. Uh, I think, you know, when Alvarez comes back, barring something really weird happening, this offense will start to make more sense um, with both a he and a healthy Altuve, who, by the way, is also still dealing with an injury. He's just evidently a much tougher man than Jordan Alvarez. <laughs> Well, That's people remember that when, right? they, when they complain with him getting a day off, he's still dealing with an oblique. Um, Brian, any any parting shots before we we bounce? I mean, we have uh, Fromber, Javier, and Brown going this week against the Mets, a struggling team. As frustrating as it's been, I still like our odds. All right, well, that does – wrap up go go astros um i guess we still will get one finding thought because that's how this show works my final thought is it ain't over till it's over and we didn't quit when the germans bomb pearl harbor go strokes oh me okay sure. um mets astros this week and then dodgers after that welcome to the struggle bus yeah Welcome to the Struggle Bus, but an easy schedule after that. Gentlemen, we will be back next week. We'll be back on Tuesday next time. Until then, go Strohs. Go Strohs. Go Strohs.